Okay, so this is an Edexcel Literature Paper 2 walkthrough. Um, you don't need the actual paper for this. I'm just going to go through the basics of exam technique and how to answer the questions. It's not a revision video, it's an exam walkthrough. So basically it's instructions on how to answer each question, not necessarily about the content. Okay, so this is the Edexcel Literature Paper 2. It's 2 hours and 15 minutes. There are three parts to this exam, so it's longer than paper one, and there's more to it. In part A of this paper, you will be asked to answer two questions on a Christmas carol. For part B, you will be asked to compare two poems from the conflict cluster of the Edexcel Poetry Anthology, and part C, um, or section two of this, is about unseen poems, so there's three essays one that has two parts and three essays generally that you need to write for this paper in two hours and 15 minutes. So as for before, I'm telling you how can you revise for this? Well, GCSE Pod would help. Mr. Bruff on YouTube has a number of Christmas Carol videos that are really quite good and a few on the poems. And Mary Meredith has YouTube tutorials for each of the 15 Edexcel poems. We also offer Monday nights, which I should have added, um, every day from 2.45 to 3.45. And we've also provided you with a knowledge organizer. And on the knowledge organizer, as the blue arrow is pointing towards the quotations. And the quotations we've picked are ones that you should know. Know who said them, and when they said them, and why they said them. And that would really help you with your whole text part of the exam. Plus there's contextual information and a rundown of the entire book. Okay, so those are just a few ways to help you get started on revising for A Christmas Carol. Okay, so as I said, there's three parts to this exam. Um, the first one is 19th century A Christmas Carol. For that, it's always question four in the answer booklet. So this is still causing problems for people when they're answering in their booklet, but it's because there are other texts that we could have picked and the same exam book goes out to all students studying at Excel. So you have to just tick question four. And for conflict poetry, it's always question nine because there are two other, in fact, now there are three other cl clusters we could have studied. So we always answer question nine and for unseen poetry, it's always question um, 11 might be 12 now on this on this year. This is the first year when they're offering an, a new set of poems. Okay, um, so <clears throat> okay, so in your answer book, flip through and make sure you're answering in the right part. So just a word about timings. Um, you should spend 55 minutes on A Christmas Carol for both questions. So that's about 22 and a half minutes on part A and 22 and a half minutes on part B. And then 35 minutes on the top poem and 45 minutes on the unseen poem. Okay, so before you start, when you think about Dickens and A Christmas Carol, you should always think about what the purpose is, what the author's purpose is. So why he wrote the book and what it is he's trying to accomplish through the novel. And in his preface, Dickens wrote, I have endeavored, which means I have tried, I have endeavored in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of an idea, which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their houses pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it their faithful friend and servant, Charles Dickens. So what is this little ghost of an idea that he's trying to raise, and yet also that he's conscious he doesn't want people to be upset or out of humor with each other or themselves, and he doesn't want anyone to lay it, which means to put it aside. But it is a ghost of an idea, which he does wish will have an impact on his readers. So in a nutshell, there are three key vocabulary words that you should always use when writing any essay about A Christmas Carol, and that's he wanted to promote generosity from the wealthy to the poor, and to get the rich to accept responsibility for their human, the fellow humans in the Victorian era, through the transformation of Scrooge from a miserable miser to a happy, generous man. So in a nutshell, 
He wants to promote generosity. He wants us to accept responsibility. And how does he do that? He shows what it takes for someone like Scrooge to transform. So just like with your Macbeth question on paper one, you are given an extract. It's usually one page or just over one page. Um, the first thing that you need to do when you get that extract is you sit and you read it through as carefully as possible and make sure you understand it. You may want to label the paragraphs, you may want to think about um, the way that this extract develops over the course of it from beginning to end. You want to give some thought into what actually is happening and it's worth spending the time doing that because if you try and answer the questions and you don't understand the majority of the extract you're going to run into problems quite quickly. So putting the time in in the beginning and reading it through very carefully is really important. Okay so once you've done that then you read the question and you highlight the key words in the question. What have you been asked to explore and then how does part B inform your understanding of part A. So part A, explore how Dickens presents Scrooge's happiness in this extract, give examples from the extract to support your ideas. So you'd answer that first and then in the second part, in part B, which you have to label clearly in your exam book, it says in this extract Scrooge is full of goodwill. Explain how goodwill is portrayed elsewhere in the novel. In your answer, you must consider who is kind to others and what these characters try to do for others. Note the key word there is elsewhere. So when you're doing part B, you cannot mention the extract. You won't get, well you can, but you won't get any marks for it. You're marked on how well you can um, explore this theme elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so once you've done that and you've read your question and you understand the question, um, the next thing you need to do is divide the extract into three so that you're planning for three paragraphs at least, three, three bits of your response, okay? So beginning, middle, and end. Now where you divide it up is up to you, it doesn't really matter, but generally when it, you're, you're looking at the beginning bit, you want to look as close to the beginning of the extract as possible, not halfway down. So for this, I would look directly at this section. The bed was his own, the room was his own, best and happiest of all the time. Before him was his own to make amends in. Okay, not halfway down. You want to start straight away. Okay, so you read through the extract, you read the question really carefully, and then you divide it into three and plan for three paragraphs at least. Now one of the things that we know as a department our students struggle with is how to analyze structure. So students tend to want to say things like there are big paragraphs, there are small paragraphs, there are short sentences, but how they explain what the effect of that structural device is, is um, something we, that uh, students find difficult. So for this I thought I would zero in on that. So I'm going to look back at that beginning of the extract. Dickens writes, the bed was his own, the room was his own, best and happiest of all the time before him was his own to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. O oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. Okay, so right away at the beginning of the extract if you took time and you thought well how does Dickens structure this opening to try and grip the reader and to show Scrooge's happiness well he's just had his encounter with the ghost of Christmas future or ghost of Christmas yet to come rather and so he's feeling quite worried and quite stressed because he's just seen his own dead body laid out on a bed stripped of everything because the, um, the people who worked for him stole everything, right, and sold it. Um, and so he's quite shaken. And then he saw his own grave. So he has woken up from this and he is getting to terms with his surroundings. So straight away you may have noticed that it starts with the bed was his own, the room was his own, best and happiest of all the time before him was his own to make amends in. Um, and most of you I'll talk about the knees in a second, but most of you would have probably realized that 
uh, he uses repetition, Dickens uses repetition. So the key question would be, well, okay, but why? Because nothing happens by accident. And immediately you will say, it's for emphasis. And some of you might even say, it's for emphasis of how he's feeling. And my class will know that immediately I would say that you're working towards a grade three response by saying that because you have not told me what he is feeling. Okay, so if you're going to talk about the structure of sentences, the order that things come through in the text, you have to explain why it's important. So you can't just say that it's for emphasis for how he's feeling. Yes, of course it is. But how is it exactly that he is feeling that he feels the need to really reassure himself that yes, this bed is his own, the room is his own, and time is his own. So you might say something like, well, this repetition of his own is establishing exactly that, that he's back in his own space. Perhaps it's showing how he needed to take it all in the order of the bed, which is his immediate personal space, and then the room, which is the larger environment, and then of course this sort of um, more abstract, almost existential idea of time or space ahead of him. Now, why is this all significant? Well, like I said before, it could be for reassurance, okay, that he is in his own space. So the encounter he just had was quite nightmarish for him and quite upsetting. So, so what about all of this? Why does he have to establish where he is and why is it so important he's on his home turf? Well, it's because he wants to make amends. So thus to establish Scrooge's transformation. So if you think back to the author's purpose, everything, every device that he uses, whether linguistic or structural, is going to be for him to put forward or enhance his his complete purpose, which is to show Scrooge's transformation and show that mistakes can be corrected and people can change. Okay, so that there in clockwork order from the word repetition at the top and all the way down to the bottom is how I would work out whether or not I'm actually analyzing how structure is used in this particular case. Okay, so if, say, for example, the structural device you're commenting on is short sentences, yes, that's fine. Yeah, okay, there could be a repetition of short sentences, but for what? And usually short sentences are to show an extreme state of emotional being. So what emotional state are they trying to show and why are short sentences the most effective? Okay, they could have a jarring effect. They usually show um, a thinking pattern that's quite fragmented. Okay, but then how do we, once we've analyzed this, and you'll note that at the end of this little portion of the extract, I've circled that he says it on his knees, and he also repeats that, on my knees, on my knees. So it'd be worth thinking about, why does he have to repeat on my knees? Okay, so if we look at our basic C structure here, I'll read it to you. This is my response. So in this extract, Dickens presents Scrooge as thrilled to be given a second chance to become a generous and caring man. Scrooge has woken up from his night with the spirits. Dickens shows he needs time to realize exactly where he is through repetition of his own. Dickens here may have used repetition to emphasize emphasize Scrooge's shock and excitement by putting the physical space he sees in the order in which he sees it. He has just been shown his own death and now is trying to make amends, which means he's been given a second chance. Dickens may want the reader to feel relieved and feel that they too have a second chance. And I think if I were writing this again, another inference I would make is that um, it's his way of reassuring himself that he is back in his own environment because his encounter with the ghost of Christmas yet to come was so emotionally charged. And then I'm zooming in. Um because this is the extract, so this is where we have to zoom in on how the structural device works. So by repeating his own three times, Dickens shows Scrooge's relief at being back in his own surroundings, where he feels comfortable and shows that he can own and take responsibility for helping those around him who need it. This structural positioning shows how grateful of the time Scrooge believes he has been given to make better choices. He says it on his knees, which shows his true humbleness. Please ignore my comma splice there. It should be full stop. He says it on his knees, which shows his true humbleness. I may talk about it being quite a submissive pose um, to be on your knees. There's a certain um, sense of redemption being sought there. And then the effect on the reader, not only would the reader feel relieved, he or she may recognize Scrooge's transformation as genuine 
and consider their own actions in life. Can we be more generous? So when you're talking about the effect, you can talk about yourself. You can talk about um, the people around you. Okay? You can ask questions. You can ask rhetorical questions to engage with the, the content of the text. So once you've written about the opening of the extract, okay, so if we look back at what you were supposed to do, so this is um, the um, extract analysis, okay, so we're looking just specifically at the extract. I just analyzed the use of repetition in the opening section. So now what I'd have to do is find something from the middle and something from the end. So you're trying to aim for three C's paragraphs zooming in. And if you think about it, if there's a part A for this question, which is the extract, and part B where you're looking at the whole text, then really for this entire question over 55 minutes, you want to be looking at six C's paragraphs. So it's no joke. And it annoys me when I see people who have finished their exam early and they've closed their book and they've pushed it away from themselves thinking, oh, I'm done. Really? Okay, you've been given two hours and 15 minutes because we believe that's what you need. Uh, well, we know that's what you need. So use all of your time effectively, okay? And again, your knowledge organizer can help you. <laughs> so do use it. It's a tool we made that you should be using, okay? Make revision cards for the quotations, test each other, and help each other out. So part B, in this extract, Scrooge is full of goodwill. So it tells you essentially the answer, okay? And then you have to explain how goodwill is portrayed elsewhere in the novel. So the key word there is elsewhere. Do not talk about the extract. It will tell you though what to talk about. So in your answer, you must consider who is kind to others and what characters try to do for others. So again, I think you should always plan for this question. Better responses tend to have some element of planning. Otherwise, you risk spending time waffling and not really adding to your response in an authentic way, or you may not have any direction and you'll lose steam. So in the middle, we write what the question is about and what you're looking at. And then again, just like with an extract, uh, if you're dealing with a text, which A Christmas Carol is just over 100 pages, so it's not too long. You want to think about how goodwill is shown or not in the beginning, the middle, and the end. And you want to consider what vocabulary you'll have to use. Regardless of what question it is for part B, these are words that you will have to use if you're writing a decent response. So things like generosity, social reform, which means change. It is in the Victorian era that the story takes place and was written. Um, and it shows us the responsibility that we should have for each other in somewhat the same way as um, an inspector calls. Um, miserable or miser, which means being really um, tight with money to the point of hurting others. And ignorance, want, needing things, and transformation are words I believe you may need to use. Okay, so... Like all things, when you're planning a literature response, you need to consider the author's purpose. And it's exactly the same from what I mentioned before, to promote generosity from the wealthy to the poor, to get the rich to accept responsibility for their fellow humans in the Victorian era, through the transformation of Scrooge from a miserable miser to a happy, generous man. That's a long sentence, but you get my point, okay? So now you want to think about how is this shown in the beginning, the middle, and the end. So in the beginning, you have a lot of choices. You can talk about Fred, who talks about, and this is on your knowledge organizer, all the quotations that you could use for this. So you have Fred, who says that Christmas is, you know, the best time of year, the time to be merry, the time to be generous. You've got the portly gentlemen who come and say, Christmas is when we ask for people to be generous because those who are poor need the, the money. You've got Fan being kind to her brother. You've got Belle who realizes that um, she's kind to Scrooge in a way because she lets him, she releases him. And you've got Fezziwig, the boss that he sees from when he was a young apprentice. Okay, you've got Scrooge saying, are there no prisons, are there no workhouses as his response to this? And he says people should die and decrease the surplus population. You may want to mention things like the poor law, as long as it's connected to the author's purpose. Okay, 
basically Fezziwig in particular strikes me as a good one for this because he says that Fezziwig showed that a boss has the power to make work a burden, um, a toil or a pleasure, a burdensome or a pleasure. And seeing Fezziwig's goodwill to himself as a young man is what partially inspires Scrooge to realize his own role as Bob Cratchit's boss and that he too can have that kind of power and um, generosity. So in the middle of the book I was thinking there's the Cratchit's Christmas, they have a really small goose, they're grateful, um, Cratchit who really um, doesn't really owe Scrooge very much also toasts to his goodwill. So even though Cratchit's wife is upset, Dickens shows Cratchit and his wife showing goodwill even to those who don't deserve it, aka Scrooge. Okay, but the Cratchit's Christmas is something to really pay attention to because despite the fact that they are poor, they are wealthy in love for each other and in happiness in, in themselves as a family, which is perhaps Dickens telling us where true wealth comes from. And then finally, um, in the end, you have the opposite of goodwill because you can show at least one example where you are switching things around. So not where goodwill is shown, but where goodwill is not shown. And I was thinking there's this really powerful scene where the washerwoman, the cleaner and the undertaker, the charwoman she's called, and the undertaker have stolen from Scrooge's dead corpse. And they claim that he was so cruel in life that he deserves it. But this is of course showing their desperation because they're poor. So had Scrooge shown them more goodwill in life, they likely would not have stolen from his dead corpse. And the description of the descent into um, where the rag and bone man is selling stuff uh, and buying other people's stuff is quite visceral and quite um, gross <laughs> to show, I think. It's almost like a descent into hell. And it's really showing the desperate um, conditions that the poor lived in in those days. So that's a general plan for a part B section. Obviously it doesn't even need to be that detailed, but you do need to consider at least something from the beginning, something from the middle, and something from the end. So you want again three C's paragraphs. So if you think about it and you're spending 55 minutes on this question, if you take away 10 minutes for reading the extract, annotating it, making sure you understand it really, really thoroughly, and then writing three paragraphs and then planning a part B section. You don't have longer than about 22 to 25 minutes per section. So how many minutes is that per C's paragraph? Not very many. Okay, so you have to use your time wisely. So here is that plan, one section of that plan written out, and you should be aiming for three of these. So again, I'm using C's, but if you just look down to the, the fourth row where it says zoom out. Now, you can talk about context for A Christmas Carol a little bit, but really it, only if it's connected to his purpose, when he lived and why he wrote what he wrote. What you can do though, and should do, is zoom out on other parts of the text. So here's where you should be linking. So you may have learned acronyms before like PEEL or PEDAL or that kind of thing. We like C's and it's because here you can zoom out. So you're still making links to other parts of the text. Because again, you can't talk about the extract. So Dickens's purpose through the novel A Christmas Carol is to raise awareness about the awful conditions that poor people lived in during the Victorian era. In some cases, as a direct result of the lack of goodwill towards them by the rich. Scrooge's transformation from a miserly and miserable tight-fisted hand to a generous and giving individual begins in the second stave, when the ghost of Christmas past shows him important scenes from his past. One such scene is when Scrooge is shown his first boss, Fezziwig, gave a fabulous Christmas party, which he put on for his employees and family for the cost of a few pounds. The ghost is surprised that Scrooge would be so emotional over seeing this and asks him how he remembers Fezziwig. Scrooge says that Fezziwig had the power to make work light or burdensome or a pleasure or a toil. 
So here I infer that Dickens could be showing that Scrooge is beginning to see his own role and finally feel the responsibility he should feel as the boss of Bob Cratchit. It's only through remembering the kindness that he was shown that Scrooge realizes that he is not shown any goodwill to Cratchit. At the party, Fezziwig is dancing and having a great time and his kindness went a long way to making the employees feel valued and trusted. Earlier in the novel, Scrooge had a small fire. This is at his workplace, I should have said. But Bob had an even smaller one and didn't give... Scrooge didn't give him, it should say, any warmth or compassion. Scrooge also lectured on asking for Christmas Day off. On his, Scrooge also lectured Bob, sorry, for asking for Christmas Day off and insisted he come in on time the next day and compared the gesture to robbing him. Scrooge's lack of goodwill begins to change as he has shown the consequences of his actions. Alongside the si scenes from his childhood, where Scrooge is shown to be lonely and neglected, the scene with Fezziwig is no doubt designed by Dickens to show the reader that Scrooge hasn't always been a cruel person and perhaps wonder what happened to him to make him so miserable and uncharitable. So that's a basic C's paragraph. Um, I've added a bit more detail than you'd need to for five, but it's it's about it's about a high five, I'd say. If all the paragraphs were like this, then it's a lot closer to a six. Okay, and you want to aim for three. Okay, the poetry. So you have 35 minutes to answer this section, so that's not very long. It's about 10 minutes per C's paragraph, and then a bit of time. Um, well, no, it's five minutes per C's paragraph, really. Um, but anyway, so 35 minutes, and uh, so far the named poems have been Belfast, Confetti, The Poison Tree, and War Photographer, because the course has been going for three years. So in 2018, this was the poem that we got. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe, I told it not, my wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears, and I sunned it with smiles and with soft deceitful wiles. And it grew both day and night, till it bore an apple bright, and my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole when the night had veiled the pool, in the morning glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. So after you reread the poem, you have to read the question really carefully. In this case, reread a poison tree, choose one other poem from the conflict anthology, compare how anger is presented in the two poems. In your answer, you should consider the poet's use of language, form, and structure, influence of the context in which the poems were written. So you're looking at anger, and you could pick any others. Lots of our students picked um, Cousin Kate, um, and a few picked uh, Half Cast. Um, so there's a number of poems that you could have picked that are about anger, either to oneself or to family or to society. Okay, you're going to have to talk about language, form, and structure. So what kind of poem it is, what language is used, and how it's put together. And you'll want to talk about the influence of the context, which means who wrote it, when, and why. And you don't need a lot of detail about that, but you need a light touch, at least a little bit, that shows that you understand where it came from and why. Okay? And then at the bottom, uh, you get a reminder of the other poems. So it lists all 15 poems as a prompt to help you think about which ones or which one you may want to talk about. Okay? So now we're going to look at an example answer. It's a top mark answer. Um, and it does everything that you're supposed to do. So it has a C's structure, but not necessarily in the right order that we would teach it in. But it does have everything that it needs. So I'm going to read it to you um, and see. I'm not going to give you a copy of it. I'll just read it to you because the hand, it's handwritten and students sometimes find the handwriting difficult to read. So I'll read it to you. Try and follow along while I read it. The main way in which Blake portrays anger in a poison tree is through the use of the metaphor of the tree. The idea and metaphor of the tree portrays how nature grows over time, but also the idea that we nurture anger. This is seen when he says, as I watered it in fears. The idea of watered implies feeding and nurturing, 
thus implying anger excuse me anger is something that we ourselves nurture inside of us anger is also presented as something that grows over time Blake achieves this through the use of binary opposites such as night and morning and day and night. This creates a sense of time passing and, before I switch to the next page, I just want to say if you look above this blue arrow here, the idea of watered implies feeding and nurturing, thus implying anger is something that we ourselves nurture inside of us. That's a really good example of zooming in. Like, the idea of watered might not be a word that you might have originally seen, but the literal meaning of watered is, you know, providing nutrients to plants, so therefore it does imply feeding and nurturing. So if you're watering your anger, then metaphorically you are nurturing your anger inside of you. Okay, so it's a very astute, well-written, very clear section. So this last bit was, this creates a sense of time passing and thus how anger develops and grows over time. Continuing the extended metaphor, Blake talks of how anger bears fruit. Fruit usually connotes to the idea of life, but here we see it causes death. This juxtaposition is further enhanced through the use of bright and shine to describe the apple, both of which have very positive connotations. And yet we later learn the foe outstretched beneath the tree. This portrays the deceptive nature of anger. We may believe we have a right to feel angry and it's a good thing, but ultimately it causes destruction. All of this paragraph is zooming in. You have the reference to fruit, bright and shine outstretched beneath the tree and uh, the fruit connotes the bright and shine um, has very positive connotations the outstretched beneath the tree portrays the deceptive nature of anger so each little quote is then described about what it is connoting what it is um, implying another poem which presents anger is cousin kate by christina rossetti so just as a side note here, you'll notice that what this candidate or what this student has done is provided a, an analysis of the poison tree. And instead of interweaving references to um, Cousin Kate, they've just waited and now they're going to do a bit of, a, of an analysis of Cousin Kate separately. Okay, but about anger. So when they say in the beginning there, that first line, another poem which presents anger, that is a way to connect your ideas. Um, they do, however, later on have sections where the paragraphs are interleaved between the two poems. Um, in this poem, it talks less of general emotion and more of the anger of a specific individual. Rossetti also portrays anger as something that grows over time. This is achieved through the ballad style of the poem. The idea of telling a story implies that it all happened over a prolonged period of time. In A Poison Tree, there's also a very strong sense of the anger being directed at the foe. And this is also achieved in Cousin Kate. The narrator's anger is clearly directed at her cousin Kate, which we see from how she says, Oh, cousin Kate, twice. The fact that she calls her cousin Kate also highlights the family connection and... also heightens the sense of betrayal the narrator feels. Cousin Kate portrays anger much more personally than a poison tree. This is seen in the repeated use of you, which shows how fiercely direct her anger is. There's also a strong sense of bitterness, which we see through how she draws direct contrast between herself and her cousin, such as how people call her cousin good and pure, but call her an outcast thing. By using parallelism and drawing direct comparisons, Rossetti gives a strong sense of how unjust the narrator feels the situation is. The narrator also shows clear disdain towards Cousin Kate, saying that your love was written in sand, implying that she is fickle and untrue. Also, she says, had she been in her cousin's position, she'd have spit in his face, an open act of disgust. All of this conveys the strong sense of betrayal the narrator feels and the ensuing air anger that it caused. She criticizes Kate openly with disgust. In Blake's poem, A Poison Tree, or sorry, Blake's poem, A Poison Tree, is a 
is from a collection of poems called Songs of Experience, many of which had a moral tone, and a poison tree is no different. Blake uses simplistic language and a simple A-A-B-B -B rhyming scheme. This gives the poem a real sense of rhythm, and the simple language to convey a complex message makes it memorable. Blake's purpose here is to clearly teach against anger, and to teach this lesson clearly and simply. The more moral as um, aspect of this poem is enhanced by its biblical connotations, the Bible story of Adam and Eve and the poison fruit. So this is a con um, contextual information. The almost childlike simplicity of the tone of both the language and the very basic structure of the stanzas and poem as a whole ensures that Blake's lesson will be remembered. Contrasting this, Rossetti's purpose is very different, and thus the poem has a different tone. Rossetti worked in St. Mary's Penitentiary, where she helped mothers who had had children outside of marriage, which was seen as, as sinful at the time. Therefore, she experienced firsthand the pain, suffering, and anger that these w of, of these women, and the purpose of the poem is to tell their story and express anger on their behalf. Therefore, she finishes the poem by giving them a small victory, their child, their shame, their pride, whereas a poison tree finishes on a more morbid note. Also, Rossetti clearly wants the audience to sympathize with the narrator and support her in her anger. She creates this symphony through the use of the simile, he changed me like a glove. This clearly shows how blatantly she was objectified and refers to herself as a thing so the audience would feel sympathy for her, but may feel no sympathy for the narrator of a poison tree. Therefore, although both poems talk about anger as something long-lasting and direct, they differ fundamentally in their structure. Whereas a poison tree which is, wishes to teach a lesson, and the poem is structured to have a clear moral message, Cousin Kate simply wishes to express the anger. Therefore, it uses much more emotive language. It uses a rhyme scheme, A, B, C, B, D, B, in order to add a sense of innocence, in order to make it more poignant when that innocence is taken away. Rossetti wishes to make the audience feel the anger the narrator feels, but Blake wishes to teach against anger altogether. In A Poison Tree, anger is a sin, but in Cousin Kate, it is simply a justified emotion. So the mark for that essay I just wrote is, as I'm sure you've guessed, 20 out of 20. Um, it's a really comprehensive comparison, um, but more importantly, it just goes through, talks about the author's purpose, and talks about references to the poem, language, imagery, and structure used. Um, what's the best advice for writing about poetry? You need to know the poems. But, 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 my students, <laughs> you need to know the poems. There's no way around it. So a basic structure for how to plan. Um, you're looking for three C's paragraphs, but it might be more like six mini paragraphs. Okay? Um, you want to compare how anger or whatever it is that you're asked about is presented in both poems. So a basic general structure, which would get you over the grade five mark if it was done well, would be a simple C's paragraph about poem one, and then a connective like similarly or on the other hand, um, C's paragraph on poem two. Okay? And then repeat, basically, until you don't have any time left. Okay? So you need to plan for it. You need to think about what's similar, what's different, um, or even just the fact that while well, anger in this poem is presented in this way and um, anger in the other poem is presented that way. You don't really, for a grade four, have to go into a direct comparison like, well, in this it's this way and it's similar or it's different. It's just saying, well, it's presented this way in one poem and it's presented th the other way in the other poem. Okay? So that's a basic structure. And then finally, um, 40, with 45 minutes left on the clock, you need to get to your unseen poems, which is my favorite part of the exam. So it's two poems that you haven't seen before, and you have to sit, read them, understand them, and then compare. So 
you have 45 minutes for this, like I said. These were the two poems in 2018. So poem one is called The Month of May, and poem two is called British Weather. I've cut off the authors, but they are given to you, so you can use the author's name. So poem one, The Month of May. Oh, the month of May, the merry month of May, which is a quote by Thomas Decker in 1632, but the poem wasn't written in 1632. The month of May, the merry month of May, so long awaited and so quickly passed. The winter's over and it's time to play. I saw a hundred shades of green today and everything that man made was outclassed. The month of May, the merry month of May. Now hello pink and white and farewell grey. My spirits are no longer overcast. The winter's over and it's time to play. Sing fa la 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 la, I dare to say tried being modern but it didn't last the month of may the merry month of may i don't know how much longer i can stay the summers come the summers go so fast and soon there'll be more no more time to play so carpe diem gather buds make hay the world is glorious compare contrast december with the merry month of may now is the time now is the time to play and carpe diem it says in your glossary is latin for seize the day and this one, poem two, British weather, you can see which one you agree with more. <laughs> Slightly different tone. It is the merry month of May, when everything is cold and grey. The rain is dripping from the trees and life is like a long disease. <laughs> the storm clouds hover round like ghouls. The birds all sing because they're fools. And beds of optimistic flowers are beaten down by thunder showers. Under a weak and watery sun, nothing seems to be much fun. Exciting as a piece of spring, string, sorry, this is the marvelous British spring. <laughs> so you can see which one of those poems you agree with more when May comes, because that's when you'll be writing your exams. Okay, so here is an example. Again, it's quite a high level one. So if you think about what you would need um, for a basic structure for this, this achieved 18 out of 20. Firstly, the poems have a contrasting tone. The month of May has a very upbeat tone. The rhythm is iambic tetrameter, which connotes a feeling of happiness in the reader's head. I saw a hundred shades of green today. The first person monologue expresses how the voice is feeling optimistic observing her surroundings. In contrast, British weather has a very patronizing tone. The beds of optimistic flowers are beaten down by thunder showers. The poet has explored the theme of failed optimism, suggesting the voice has had an under undeserving past of being mistreated. This therefore makes the reader sympathize with the voice of the poem. Furthermore, the month of May is a ballad poem. It says ballard, but I'm assuming it should say ballad. It has a chorus of the month of May, the merry month of May. This suggests that the poet's intentions of the poem for it to be sung. The repetition of the line emphasizes the jolliness. As well as this, the alliteration in the sound M evokes a feeling of happiness and content. M is a very homely phonic associated with warmth. On the other hand, British weather has an all alteration in its regular rhythm, thus emphasizing the importance of the line, this is the marvelous British spring. The poet has used this line ironically to, um, to something, the depressing opinion of spring previously. The quotation can be interpreted by the reader as the voice concluding that he will be fine. He is used to his discomfort. <laughs> um, there is evidence to show how the poem can be interpreted as, as being an extended metaphor for mental health. Cold and grey suggests his emotions, feels empty. The storm clouds hover round like ghouls. Thus, this imagery suggests he can't escape his mental state. This evokes the feeling of being trapped. To conclude, British weather can be seen as a cry for help, whereas the month of May is celebrating the hope that's coming. Finally, the month of May uses imperative verbs to direct the reader. Sing, fa la 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 la, this suggests, in, um, this engages the reader. They feel directly spoken to and as results, <laughs> makes them take in the language and images. 
Wendy Cope is trying to portray. That's the author. Furthermore, the verb sing has positive connotations of free will and happiness. The poets wants you to give your life, taking every moment as it comes. Live your life, sorry. Taking every moment as it comes. Gather buds, make hay, the world is glorious. The imperative verbs also show the reader that the reader must put effort in to see the results. See the glorious world. This is greatly contrasted against British weather. The poem explores the horror and misfortune of the world. Life is like a long disease. <laughs> this simile is used to connote the idea that life isn't worth living. The ending is inevitable. Long disease explores the theme of suffering and pain. This creates negative imagery in the reader's head and establishes a horrible tone. In conclusions, both poems uh, use effective structure and language to portray the message. The month of May expressed the positivity of the world through techniques of the ballad, dialectic, I think it's supposed to say dactylic diameter and repetition. However, British weather shows how the world, it, how the something is negative through the use of similes and imagery. Okay, so there's quite a lot of um, grammatical errors in this one, but it's still achieved an 18 out of 20 because it's pretty forensic reading of both poems and a good comparison of them too. So in a brief recap, the Edexcel Literature Paper 2 is 2 hours and 15 minutes. You have to answer one question essentially in two parts on A Christmas Carol. Um, you have to answer a section on the conflict poetry where you are given one poem but you have to compare it to one that you remember from memory. You should plan this one. Um, and you have to do a section on an unseen poem, which is 45 minutes long. So neither of those poems will be studied before. None of them will be, um, we have no idea what they are and they're both related by a theme. Okay, so that is literature paper two in a nutshell. Make sure you do your revision.